Alright guys, so we can go ahead and get started. So many of you have seen Dr. Scott Lemire speak here before. So again, he's an alumni of Quincy University um, and now he works at Baylor. Um, and today he's going to have a little different talk focusing more on surgical treatment. So again, we thank you for coming and talking with us again. Yeah, thanks. It's really a pleasure to be back. Um, for those of you that saw the last two talks, we focused a lot on science and research. Uh, in laboratory research in particular, and how we're trying to better understand why the aorta uh, tends to degenerate in some people and leading to um, aortic disease. So today I thought we'd focus more on the, the doctor side of it and what it's like to treat these patients and give you a little bit of flavor of what the surgery is like for patients that have this disease. Um, there'll be a little bit of science in it because I'll go over some clinical studies that we did to try to make these operations safer. Um, so you heard a lot about seeing mice and evaluating tissue and cells. That's, that's, that's in an effort to try to better understand the disease and come up with new types of treatment. But we also do clinical research, which is designed to better understand uh, how best to treat the patients we have now, rather than looking at sort of future. Uh, future. Again, this is super um, meant to be super informal, so at any time just stop me and ask questions if anything's not clear. Very glad, very glad to answer uh, anything you might have. Uh, I am going to, there's going to be some testing going on, and we're going to try to uh, have the whole group think like surgeons, so you think more about how you might take care of a patient and how you might design an operation to take care of a patient and what things you might have to worry about. So I hope you all have brushed up on some of your anatomy. Um, uh, these are just my standard disclosures for some of the companies that I do uh, research and other work with. Uh, so for those of you who, who haven't been here before, the focus of my clinical practice as well as our research program is aortic disease. And you all know the aorta is the largest artery in the body. All of the blood that comes out of the left side of the heart enters uh, through the uh, aortic valve. Let's see, does that does, yeah. So the aortic valve, which is right here, and then distributes blood along the length of the aorta throughout the entire body. So when you have a problem with your aorta, you've got a big problem because that's the main, that's the main source of oxygenated blood to the entire body. So the diseases we study are aneurysm and dissection. And aneurysms are a weakening of the aortic wall so that instead of the normal diameter as shown uh, within the patient there, the, the aorta starts to balloon out as shown in the call out here, and that's called an aneurysm. And once that gets large enough, two really bad things can happen. One, it can rupture, just like blowing out a tire. That's usually a fatal event. Or it can tear, which is called dissection. And dissection is shown here. So you'll know from histology that the aorta is composed of three main area, uh, layers. The inner layer is the intima, the middle layer is the media, and the outer layer is called the adventitia. When you get a dissection, blood actually breaks through a small tear in the intima, gets into the media, and then causes the media to split lengthwise down the length of the aorta. Sort of like if you took a piece of plywood, and you know, plywood's in layers, but if you started to split it, and then you were able to pull that plywood in the, in a, uh, out through its layers. So that creates a, a problem because you have a weak outer aortic wall that's very likely to rupture, and it causes some flow disturbances, I'll show you in a moment. <coughs> Aneurysms and dissections can affect any part of the aorta. So what I just showed you were aneurysms in the ascending aorta, right near the heart. Um, this is an aneurysm in the descending thoracic aorta. So this would be along the spine on the left, but above the diaphragm. And so similarly, you can get an aneurysm there, or you can get a dissection. So the, here with the dissection, you can see the tear that I told you about, and then how that blood is entered and caused this splitting. So you end up with two channels. The normal channel in the aorta, which is called the true lumen, and then this new false channel in the aorta, which is called the false lumen, and this is that weak, thin outer aortic wall that's prone to rapid dilatation and rupture, which is almost universally fatal. Additionally, because there are branches of the aorta, um, this disturbs the flow in those branches and can cause problems related to inadequate blood flow to any of the organs in the body. So uh, dissection is a very serious problem. Aortic disease, aneurysms and dissection kill more than 10,000 people in the United States every year, so it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. What I'm going to talk about today are called thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms. So what is that? 
I showed you ascending aortic aneurysms. You may have heard of the most common aneurysm, which are called abdominal aortic aneurysms. They tend to uh, exist below the kidneys, a small area down here. Thoracoabdominal aneurysm means it involves the aorta in the chest, so that's where the thoraco part is. The diaphragm would be right here. And then the abdominal aorta. So now you've got an aneurysm that affects the aorta in two main body cavities, the chest and the abdomen. You have to figure out how you're going to treat it. And you're all going to help me figure that out today. Uh, so as a start on that, I thought we'd be sure everybody's on the same page about the branches of the aorta. And it'll help us think about what concerns we might have when trying to treat an aneurysm involving what amounts to most of the aorta. So we're going to just go around the room and talk about a couple of things. The names of these various vessels, what they provide perfusion to, and what the consequences of inadequate flow to those would be. So let's start in the ascending aorta. And let's start with that vessel here with the first seat here. You. What's the vessel there? Yeah. Um. So as a hint, uh, the heart would be sitting right here, if it was here. This is the aortic valve. So it would be the first branch of the aorta. Are you talking about the ascending aorta? The first branch off of the ascending aorta, yeah. This right here. This is the coronary. This is one of the coronary arteries. So it's. We often think about the big branches that come off the aorta, and we'll talk about each of these. But the first branch is actually the two coronary arteries. So this would be the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. And so they provide perfusion to what? Next. Um, the coronary arteries blood flow to. So all the blood flow to your heart comes from these two coronary arteries. So any disease affecting the main vessel here, the aorta, can <coughs> cause problems. And so who can guess what, what happens when you interfere with flow to the blood vessels in the heart? Yeah, MI, myocardial infarction, or heart attack is commonly known. So dissections, which can actually uh, go down into the, the area where the coronaries are, can present with symptoms of a heart attack. And it's actually a real big problem because you show up in the emergency room and they think you're having a heart attack. Your EKG shows signs of a heart attack, chest bad, chest pain, and they treat you for a heart attack. One of the first line treatments for that is a very, very strong blood thinner. The problem is these patients need emergency surgery, so you've just given a very strong drug that's going to interfere with coagulation to somebody that now needs an emergency operation. And it can really interfere um, with the ability to keep bleeding under control during the operation. Okay, that's the coronaries. Next branch. Okay, I think we're at the third seat. Um, is it the right subclavian? Okay, close. It's on the right side, but what's more proximal than the right, what's proximal to the right subclavian? Is it the brachiocephalic? Brachiocephalic, yeah. We call it the anonymous artery, um, so, but, but I think Officially, brachiocephalic artery is what, um, what you'll learn in anatomy class, and so it branches into the right subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery. So if we interfere with blood flow to this vessel, what, hap what could happen? Stroke. Okay. And one other thing, major thing. You could get ischemia or right arm. So you could get to the point where you have no blood flow going to the right arm and you get muscle failure and nerve failure in the arm. So the patient <coughs> present with, first of all, uh, who can tell me what physical sign they might present with? I don't expect you all to know this, but I just want you to start thinking about how you might identify this problem in a patient. Okay, if we felt the pulse in the two arms, do you think they'd be different? Yeah, you'd have, you'd have a strong pulse on the left and no pulse on the right. And if you measured the blood pressures in two arms, you'd see a difference in the blood pressures, right? 
maybe a normal or high blood pressure on the left and a low blood pressure on the right. If the ischemia gets bad enough, they won't be able to feel their fingers, they won't be able to move the right arm. Okay. And then, of course, stroke. Stroke with symptoms suggesting that the right side of the brain is affected, so maybe they can't move their left arm. Okay, next blood vessel. Close? Common Left common carotid artery, yeah. So the symptoms would be, the problems would be. Um, oh. Ah, she's passing it along. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, stroke? Stroke, yeah. So any sort of neurologic problem, and the worst of which would be stroke or coma, right? Okay, next blood vessel. Subclavian artery is right, okay, and it supplies what? <coughs> Good. Good. Left arm. And anything else? This is like an extra credit question. <laughs> so there's a branch of the left subclavian called the vertebral artery, which runs blood also up to the back of the brain, more near the brain stem, uh, cerebellum, in that area. And so you can get neurologic symptoms even uh, with a left subclavian artery. But the big thing would be a diminished pulse in the left arm, lower blood pressure in the left arm. If it got severe enough, inability to move the arm or feel the arm. Okay, let's move along. Now we're, so the diaphragm is here or here. So this would be thoracic aorta here, descending <coughs> thoracic aorta here, and then this would all be abdominal aorta here. First branch. Probably four answers you could give that would be reasonable. Let's move down there. No. Anybody? Celiac access, okay, or celiac trunk. Um, it is the first branch in the abdominal aorta. It gives rise to three vessels. Any ideas what these supply? Broadly, not real specific. Intestines? Okay, intestines. That's a, that's a uh, reasonable guess, and actually, I, I'm going to accept that because <laughs> some of the branches of this do go to the duodenum and the very first part of the small bowel. Um, so the big branches of the celiac are the left gastric, the splenic, which goes to the spleen, of course, and then the common hepatic, which goes to the liver. But the gastric, because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, branches that come off the gastric, um, and a lot of collateral that comes off that area of circulation it actually also feed, it feeds the first part of the small bowel of the duodenum, so the intestine is no cancer. Okay, <laughs> next. Uh, I think we're second seat in the second row, the third row. Yeah. What's your question? What's that vessel? Superior mesenteric artery. So I've given you that. Who can tell me what it supplies? Mostly small bowel and a bit of the large bowel. Okay. Um, but also, um, yeah, pri primarily let's just go with small bowel. So consequences of reduced flow would be ischemia of the bowel, which that's bad, right? And you can end up having parts of the bowel that um, become dead and have to be removed. Um, initially, you present a bowel with, with belly pain and um, GI problems. Okay, one more major one in this area. Okay, who is next? Okay, anybody? <coughs> Renal. Renals, good. So that, this is the left renal here, the right renal is on the other side, so these supply the kidneys and lack of blood flow to the kidneys causes renal failure.
So patients present not making any urine and with blood levels of uh, creatinine and other things going up and eventually can lose their kidney, the function of their kidneys. Okay, last two. Anybody know these? What you say? What is it? Is it iliac? iliac. Yeah, so the first one, the most proximal one is the iliac, and then that branches into, um, you have an external iliac, an internal iliac, and eventually a femoral artery, okay, and that supplies blood flow to the leg. And all the things we talked about with the arm can also happen to the leg. So you get a reduced pulse if you measure blood pressure in the ankles. Um, you have a reduced blood pressure, and you can actually end up with ischemia in the leg where you are unable to use your muscle, unable to feel anything, and eventually the muscle dies and you could lose your leg. So I hope all that doesn't seem like esoteric stuff I'm dredging up from anatomy class, because you're going to see why all this is important and why we have to think carefully about all these these things during when we're taking care of patients with these problems. So let's get to this. Those were the easy questions, now the hard question. How, how are we going to, how are you going to fix this? We've got an aneurysm that starts right past the subclavian artery. It's a large aneurysm prone to rupture and extending all the way past the diaphragm into the abdominal aorta into the area right where the aorta splits into the two iliac arteries. How are we going to fix this? There are no bad ideas here. But let's say no, there no, nobody's ever invented an operation. How are we, we going to fix this? Any ideas? Some of you may know how we fix this, which is even better. But well, in the late... Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say you have to restore blood flow to the true lumen instead of the false. Okay. Find a way to like close, I guess, the false lumen to where primary blood flow goes. Okay, that's good. And there are, there are <coughs> when, when we have brand new tears, particularly in the ascending aorta, that's actually part of the strategy is to get all the blood flow into the true lumen and to put those layers back together to the best we can. And we talk about stents. Which are the, the, uh, Stents are also meant to do that because you put it in the true room and it moves that wall back up to where it belongs and, and compresses the false room. So that's good. Um, so what are you proposing? We open this thing up and somehow glue all the layers together and then close it up? No. Probably oh, not. Okay. All right. Uh, that has been done. So that has been done. Usually now the aneurysm is this extensive, but that has been done. Who's got another idea? Um, like last time we talked about like putting a graft, inserting a graft in it. Putting a graft in there, that's right. Okay, so we're going to put a graft in there, and I think I promised last time I would bring one. This is, this is that graft. And uh, it's made out of Dacron, and I'll pass it around, and it happens to have Scottish plaid on one side. This company is from... Uh, the company's based in Scotland. The ones we put in don't have that. <laughs> this didn't come out of anybody, so it's safe, all right? Uh, it's made out of Dacron, and there's a story I can tell you later about how these came to be, because it was actually invented by a surgeon named Michael DeBakey, who is um, the founder of the department that I work in, and I'll, sh I'll show some of his work before. Because they used to repair aneurysms by using aortas from people who had died in car accidents and and so they would send surgeons to the morgue, take out a piece of aorta, and they would bring it back and use that in, in the patients who had aneurysms to replace their aneurysm. Uh, so you have a problem there, because every, every time you need to fix an aneurysm, you need to have somebody who has part of the aorta that they're willing to give up. Um, and so he came up with the idea of what if we could synthetically create a, um, an aorta that would work as a tube to replace an aneurysm. Okay, so I'll pass that around. Okay, so we know we're going to replace this with, we're going to replace that with this. How are we going to do that? Let's just say for the sake of argument that we're going to sew one end of that here, and we're going to sew the other end of it here. How are we going to do that with all that blood going through there? Well, if you had a hose that was flowing water into this room and you had to stop it, you couldn't.
couldn't reach the spigot, what would you do? King it. Yeah, so you clamp it, you block it off, right? So you could clamp it. So one option would be just to clamp clamp the aorta. What's the problem if I clamp the aorta? What's that? You still need blood. Still need blood, yeah. Yeah. So now you've got no blood flow going to what? Anything. Yeah, anything. Anything below the clamp. So when you're doing a bowel aorta aneurysm, you put the clamp here, below the renal artery. So the only thing not getting blood flow is your injection will tolerate no blood flow for quite some time, at least an hour, without having any major problem. So you can shut blood flow off here and replace this part of the aorta. And that was the original operation done with that type of aircraft. But now you're dealing with a whole descending thoracic and valve aorta. So your kidneys are not getting, your liver's not getting any blood flow, <coughs> pancreas, spinal cord. We talked about branches, but one branch, some of the branches that aren't on there, that drawing, they're called intercostal arteries. They, they're small arteries, and you'll see some examples later. They come off along here. They're segmental, so you have one for each thoracic vertebra, then you have one for each lumbar vertebra. They supply blood to the, you know, the muscle and the soft tissues of the back, but also they give off branches that actually supply the mid portion of the spinal cord. So guess what happens if you have no blood flow going to that portion of your spinal cord? It's so basically a stroke of the spinal cord, and one of the problems with this operation we'll talk about is we have spinal cord damage and patients become paraplegic, so they can't move their legs, and this is what we want to prevent. Okay, so I think that that's enough on that. Any other, any other issues? So we figured, well, we've got to stop the blood flow, but we can do that with a clamp, and there's going to be problems with all the things that are not getting blood flow. What else do we have to do? We have to reattach those arteries somehow. We, have to, we can't just put a tube from one end to the other. We've got to end up getting circulation to all these things. So we're going to have to figure out a way to do that. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, we'll talk about the operation, which is called thoracobellum aortic aneurysm repair. I'll talk a little bit about the history, just so you see where this came from and how it evolved. And then talk about how we do the operation and how we prevent major problems related to ischemia to the liver and the bowel and the kidneys and the spinal cord. And then I'll show you a few special uh, techniques. Okay, so historical context. So this has been around, the point of this is it's only been around since the 50s, which may sound like ancient history at all, but 50s is not that long ago. This is shortly after the sort of the birth of cardiac, you know, some of the cardiac surgery. First cardiac surgeries were done in the 50s. Cardiopulmonary bypass wasn't even established until the late 50s, early 60s. So things that we think about as standard with heart surgery and, and vascular surgery really didn't even exist then. But it, it started uh, with Dr. Debakin Cooley who in Houston with this uh, Anderson repair, and then uh, Charles Robb did one in the 55, and uh, and then Etheridge. So the original approach, as I had showed, as I talked to you about, was removing the aneurysm. So here, there's no more aneurysm, and then using homographs, which are aortas from cadavers to reconstruct the aorta. And here, because it was such a large segment, they actually had to use two homographs. So two homographs together. That's when Dr. DeBakey came up with this idea of the Dacron graft, which he actually went to the Sears downtown, asked them for some, I think it was called Orlon or something, which they were out of. And he said, well, we have this new fabric called Dacron, Looked at it, he thought, okay, I'll take, it. I'll, I'll take a look at that. And he brought it home, he sewed into a tube on his wife's sewing machine. It's an absolute true story. And then tried to pick a couple dogs and sterilize them and then started using them in patients. And that's, we still use a variation of the same graph today. There's a few nuances because they're coated with gelatin and other things to help reduce bleeding through the wall of the graft. But otherwise, it's the same, it's the same type of graph that the baby created. But his idea then was a little bit more like what you had said. And, uh, well, no, because it's not, not direct repair of the aorta. But what he did was a bypass. So he ran a graft from the top to the bottom and just over sewed the stumps and then ran bypasses to all the. So this would be going to the right renal, left renal, um, and the celiac. And the SMA here. But that was not a very good way of doing that. First of all, it took a long time to construct all that. And it was a pretty bloody operation. And they were removing the aneurysm section unnecessary because the aneurysm there, the tissue there is not going to hurt you. You just don't want blood going through it. 
That was the original sort of approach that he sort of perfected in the 60s. And then Stanley Crawford came and said, you know, you don't really need to go through all that. You can just open the aneurysm. It's clamp, of course, so there's no blood going through. Then open it and put the graft on the inside and sew it at the top, and sew it at the bottom, and then reattach all the branches. And so Stanley Crawford actually developed the technique that we still use today. Now, this is what happens if you don't have one of these aneurysms repaired. So this is Dr. Crawford's early series of patients who he saw that didn't get operated on because they, they were either too sick or they, they heard about the operation. They didn't want to have the operation because it was too big of an operation, as you'll see. And this is what happens if you don't repair these. So on the x-axis is time in years, and on the, the uh, y-axis is their survival. So where you want to be is way up there by 100. And he looked at it two ways, from the date that their aneurysm was diagnosed or the date that he had actually admitted them to evaluate them and take care of them. And you can see, by the time he saw them, if they didn't get operated on, within one year, uh, only 38% were still alive. And within three years, only 14% were still alive. And most of those deaths are due to rupture of the aorta. So you've got to do something about these, or else the patients aren't going to survive. So this is the operation that he came up with, which is graft replacement of the entire thoracodominal aorta with somehow reattaching the critical vessels. These are the intercostal arteries I told you about that supply the spinal cord, which is why they're being reattached so that we keep some blood flow in the spinal cord. And then this is the celiac axis, right? The right renal, the left renal, and then this is the superior mesenteric. Uh, then we've actually reattached some lumbars in this patient that also help preserve spinal cord perfusion. And then here are the two native iliac arteries. So that's the operation. Uh, it was, as I told you, pioneered by Dr. DeBakey, who um, one of the most important cardiovascular surgeons in the, the history of the field, um, founded our department at Baylor. He, he trained uh, or worked with Dr. Crawford, who really perfected this operation. He then trained um, Joe Caselli, who's actually my boss. So you start hearing this progression as it's progressed at Baylor and to the current operation that we do now. Okay, so um, this in situ, it's called an in situ approach because you're replacing the aneurysm within itself. So it's not extra anatomic, it's actually in situ graft replacement. And that was developed by Crawford. And so here's an example of another one of those aneurysms. And this is how we do the surgery. So it's a huge incision, right? It starts behind the scapula extends across to the front of the patient, across the costal margin, and then into the abdominal cavity. We actually have to sort of rotate the patient so we can see both cavities at the same time. So most abdominal operations, everything small from an appendectomy to, as long as I've been there with a scope, but from an appendectomy to something like a, a liver transplant is done through an abdominal incision, only entering the abdominal cavity, often through an incision going up and down the middle. There's some variations like incisions over here, or for appendicitis, an incision over here, but you're only entering one cavity. Lung surgery, if you have a lung cancer, you're having it removed is usually done through a thoracotomy, which is this incision in the left chest. A heart operation would be done through the sternum in the middle, so that's called a sternotomy. But this combines the thoracotomy with the abdominal incision, so you get exposure to both cavities at the same time. Uh, this is not the same patient, but I think it shows you how we're able to get at the aorta, at least this portion of the aorta, through this incision. So through that incision, um, you split the diaphragm and then collapse the lung. So they're only, they're only ventilating the right lung through a special tube that they're using. So the left lung is collapsed and can be moved out of the way. Uh, heart is up here. And then we move the kidney and all of the abdominal organs uh, medially and towards the right, so they're out of the way. And when you do that, behind all that, what's called the retroperitoneal space is the aorta that we're then able to expose. And so we can end up seeing all the way, you wouldn't see this. You can see pretty much from the left subclavian, there's the diaphragm here, here are those intercostals I told you about, uh, all the way down to the bifurcation. So you have to know where all these vessels are and what they're feeding because you have to deal with them during the operation. Okay, so this is back to the other, the other. Okay, where did we end? I guess we'll go to the gentleman in the third, or the, I guess it's the fourth row. Okay, tell me, if you can, uh, 
uh, the yellow arrow, what structure is that? So while he's thinking. So you, part of this is that you can draw the diagram of how the anatomy looks in one viewpoint. But then you've got to, in surgery, you've got to be able to understand that anatomy looking at it many different viewpoints, inside, outside, from behind, from the front, and all of a sudden things you can get very disorienting because things aren't where you think they're supposed to be. And then disease can actually cause the anatomy to become abnormal. And then some patients have abnormal variations. So you have to be sort of prepared for all that. Any idea what this is? Anybody? Lesoclavian arteries, right. Yeah, that's the lesoclavian artery. Uh, we'll talk why it's clamped, we'll talk about why it's clamped in, the, in a moment, but um, that has a bulldog, what we call a bulldog clamp on it. Here's that clamp we talked about before, so we've already clamped the aorta in between the left common carotid and left subclavian. So we've got no blood flow going to the left arm, but the arm will tolerate that pretty well, and we've also interrupted flow to the vertebral. But usually there's enough circulation, cross circulation from the right side to keep the brain well diffused. Well, why is that? Anybody know? Circle of Willis, right. So you've got communication between the right side of the brain circulation and the left side of the brain circulation through the Circle of Willis and a variety of other areas that keeps, you can pretty much block one side off and most people uh, get perfusion for signs. Okay, well, that was, this was the easier one. So next, yellow hoodie. Uh, Green arrow. Is that the left calibre? Okay, don't look at the blood vessel. Look instead at this yellow structure. Vagus nerve. This is the vagus nerve. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why that's important because it gives off this branch in blue with the blue arrow called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which goes to your vocal cord. So if we injure that during the operation, patients can't cough, they can't speak. They're more prone to get pneumonia because they can't cough effectively and get the secretions out of their lung after surgery. So it's a big problem. Unfortunately, we have to clamp near there and the disease sometimes it causes that nerve to get stuck to the aorta. And so one of the complications of this operation is called vocal cord paralysis. And we find out because we, the patient wakes up after surgery and now they're hoarse. And so we put a little scope and we see, we, we look at the vocal cord and one of their vocal cords is paralyzed on the left side. And that can delay uh, recovery. Um, and can need treatment by the head and neck surgeons who do a thing called thyroplasty that actually helps take that cord and move it to where it needs to be so patients can then again cough effectively. Why does that nerve go all the way down there? <laughs> oh, Sorry. that's a great question. And I'm not going to answer that because I, I forgot my embryology. <laughs> but that's a great question. And so those of you who remember their embryology know that the various branches of the aorta uh, come from the various embryologic arches. And some of those go away and some of them stay. And as they move and reconfigure, some nerves happen to be pulled down and uh, end up underneath uh, blood vessels. So for and, those of you who have me for AMP2, you might remember that giraffe we looked at. So that nerve hooks around the aortic arch on the left side and it actually just goes around the right subclavian artery on the right side. It doesn't come under the aorta. So we have to be careful of it if we do something with the right subclavian artery in those patients. And if you have bilateral vocal cord paralysis, that's very bad. Because now you've got two cords that are slammed shut, which means you can't breathe. And those patients end up with a permanent uh, tracheostomy. Um, that's a very rare complication because on these operations, we're nowhere near the right side. So they're not likely. It can happen during thyroid surgery and a couple of other types of operation. <clears throat> okay, so what we've done here, we've clamped the aorta. Uh, so at least for the time being, assume there's no blood flow. Well, okay, now I've got the camera there. We're going to talk about what this is, but it's a way of providing blood flow down to the lower part of the aorta while we're working on this part of the aorta. We've cut the aorta in half up here, 
We've oversown some of those intercostal arteries. We told you about the intercostal arteries giving blood to the spinal cord and everything. Well, when you stop flow and then you open the aorta, you get back bleeding. So it's backwards bleeding through those blood vessels and you can't see and you're losing all that blood. So we sew them so that they stop bleeding. Here's one being sewn right now with this uh, soul suture. And these four have already been sewn over. And we've created an area where we're going to be able to sew that graft. So now we've sewn the graft on. Okay, we've got blood flow going up to all the branches of the head, so the brain is well protected. We've sort of moved the clamp down, and now we're opening the rest of the aorta. How long does it take for you to get from there to there, from where you started to that part there? After you've clamped it and then unclamped it? Uh, the first part uh, takes about 15 minutes to do that repair and get it really good and secure so it's not going to bleed. What you don't want to happen is you don't want this part to bleed. It has to be watertight, right? Uh, otherwise, you have ongoing bleeding, and that can be a problem. Okay, let's get back here. Also, arrow, so you know there's more quizzing coming up. <laughs> okay, so we've opened the aorta, all right, and kidney is sort of flipped up out of the way, and now we need to start dealing with the rest of the aorta. And here we've actually cut a hole in the side of the graft and reattached some intercostal arteries so that we keep blood flowing to the spinal cord. And then we've moved the clamp down so that part's getting blood flow. Now we're going to deal with portion in the abdomen. So now we have to think from the inside out. So this is a small tube delivering blood to this blood vessel. What is this blood vessel looking from the inside of the aorta? It's the celiac, okay? So now this, all your blood flow to the liver Stomach, spleen, is going through there. Okay, so I've told you that. What's this blood vessel? Superior mesenteric. Yep. So those two are getting blood from a pump. These two are actually getting cold fluid. Well, we'll talk about that. What's this one? Okay, which ring? Right renal artery. That's right. And then this is the left renal artery. Okay, good. So now we're, we've cut a hole in the graft again, and now we're sewing a patch of aorta to that opening in the graft so that now those vessels will be reattached. Because the left renal is a bit displaced, we're doing that one separately. You can see that here. There's a little button. And then once those are all on, then we do the distal anastomosis, which is right at the level where the aorta splits into the two iliac arteries, and that's the completed so that's how, do you the, deal, how do you deal with air in this? Right, so that's a great question. And so uh, as we move down, we de-air. And what that means is you remove the clamp enough so you get blood into the graft, and some of it comes out the other end of the graft. And we collect that in what's called a cell saver, which then cleans the blood, and we give it back to the patient so they don't actually lose that blood. But you de-air the graft at each movement along so that you don't send a bunch of air into the most organs tolerate air reasonably well, except for the brain and the heart. So you get a little layer, it goes to the legs, not a big deal. Even the bowel and all that will, will, will tolerate it well. But you don't want air going to the head and the heart. So that's a bigger problem during heart surgery than it is during this type of surgery. But we do de-air. Okay. Um, the point of this slide is to show that sometimes we have to replace different portions of the aorta. Sometimes a lot of the aorta, like number two, that's the most extensive repair. It's called Extent 2 Repair. Crawford came up with the classification. Basically means the entire descending thoracic aorta, entire abdominal aorta. And then sometimes not very much the aorta, just maybe all of the abdominal aorta, but we leave most of the aorta in the chest alone. That's called an Extent 4. And it's shown as the last one. And as you'd expect, the more the aorta you replace, the higher the risk of the surgery and the higher the risk of problems. So what this graph shows is the incidence of paraplegia, meaning you can't move your legs because of a spinal cord stroke, or paraparesis, you've got weakness so bad that you can move your legs, but you can't really stand and walk. Those are bad complications, right, and they're permanent in general. In the Crawford era, era he did 1,509. He died in 1992. So uh, all, of his, all of these operations he did between that period when he sort of affected the operation and when he died in uh, the early 90s, 
uh, he looked at what was the risk of paralysis of the legs in his patients. And you see that for the extent twos, the biggest repairs, a third of the patients were paralyzed. That's not a great outcome. Now, these patients would have died for sure without the operation. You still don't really want your, your end result in a third of the patients being that they can't walk. So we spent a lot of time over the ensuing years trying to figure out how to reduce the risk of paraplegia. So during these operations, because we're opening the chest and the abdomen, we're blocking blood flow to so many parts of the body and putting a strain on the heart because of clamping the aorta, we have to think about protecting all of these different organs. The spinal cord, the brain, because we're up near the arch, can cause a stroke. The heart, because clamping the aorta that high up really strains the heart. The lungs, because we have to collapse one of them and move it out of the way. Um, the kidneys, the bowel, the liver, and the limbs, because they're not getting any blood flow while you're doing the operation. So we have to come up with ways of protecting those organs. We start with that when we first see the patient before we've even operated on them by trying to optimize them for the surgery. There's some things we can do to make them more, make it more safe to undergo an operation. We do a lot in the operating room to try to protect the organs, and then after surgery, there's some considerations as well. But the goal preoperatively is to identify the patients who have uh, impairment in their ability to tolerate surgery, we call it physiologic reserve, and optimize them before the surgery. You can't do that in everybody. If somebody's got a large symptomatic aneurysm or 10 centimeter aneurysm, can't really wait. But in somebody that's got a smaller aneurysm and needs to be repaired but isn't an emergency, you maybe get them to quit smoking, maybe you treat some small infection they have, you do things so that you optimize them. But we do various things that during the operation uh, to try to protect the organs. One is cold, so we let the patient's temperature go down because cold is protective. You've heard of a kid that falls in Lake Michigan in the winter and they pull him out 30 minutes later and he wakes up and he's fine. It's because the cold is so protective of the brain. It's also protective of the spinal cord and the kidneys. So we actually let the patients get a little bit cold while we're doing, while the aorta is clamped. And there's some groups that actually freeze the patient down to the point where the brain waves stop. They call that hypothermic circulatory arrest. So that gets down to about 15, 18 degrees centigrade. That's very cold. It shuts down all the brain activity, all the metabolic activity. So you can go a long time without blood flow under those conditions. Okay, cerebral spinal fluid drainage. So, we're concerned about flow to the spinal cord. <clears throat> flow to the spinal cord depends on two big things. How much flow is coming from the blood vessels, some blood pressure, and how much pressure is around the cord. That's their CSF pressure. So just like your intracerebral pressure is dictated by the pressure of the fluid around your brain, the, uh, the spinal cord pressure is based on how much uh, swelling and fluid there is around the cord. And if you've got too much fluid, and you've got a low blood pressure, you're not going to get any blood flow to the spinal cord. And so what Dr. Cooley came up with is if you drain that fluid, you relieve some of that external pressure on the cord, it allows more perfusion even at a lower blood pressure. So we drain the fluid from, we put a little catheter in the uh, lumbar spine, and through that we're able to you know, spill here. Okay, this is just going in. We, we actually had to put it to a little um, collection bag, and then we can control how much we're draining off to keep the spinal cord well perfused. Uh, there were some questions as to whether that would be helpful or not, so we actually did a clinical trial. This is where some of the science comes in. So we took 156 patients that were undergoing either extent one or two repairs, so these are extensive repairs, and we randomized them because we didn't know whether the drainage would be helpful or not. And there was some concern that it might actually be harmful. So we randomized them. So half got drainage, half didn't get drainage. And what we found is, when you look at the incidence of being paralyzed in the legs, if you didn't use drainage, 12% of those patients had paralysis in the legs. Whereas if you do, did use drainage, only 3%. And that was statistically significant. And that was back in 2002. And pretty much everybody now uses CSF drainage uh, during these operations to, to help protect the spinal cord. So we use that in all of our step one and two repairs and keep the pressure particularly low. Uh, but there are some complications to putting a spinal burn in. That's why we, don't, we didn't just do it routinely without evidence that it was better. You can get bleeding, which can cause a spinal hematoma, which can put pressure on the cord and cause paralysis. Then you're trying to prevent it. You can get bleeding even in the head because of the shifting pressures, and that can cause serious brain injury and even death. Or it, that catheter could get infected, and then you end up with meningitis, which can have really bad complications. So you have to sort of balance the things that are good about a treatment with the things that are bad about a treatment. Luckily, these are rare, 
And you saw what a benefit we get in terms of protecting the spinal cord. And so this tends to be uh, standard treatment for these operations. I told you we reattach the segmental arteries, the intercostal arteries that maintain blood flow to the cord. You don't want to just replace it with a tube and not have any of those vessels reconnected. So we do reconnect them. That's being shown here. So you see how we've oversown these top ones because they tend not to be that important. But these middle ones tend to be really important for the spinal cord. So we open a little, we just cut a little window in that graft and then sew it around a set of intercostal arteries. It's called segmental artery reattachment. When did you first pick up a needle and thread? <laughs> no, I'm so curious. Is it yeah. when you were a child in college? So I, I, was the, I was the last person in my kindergarten class to learn how to tie their shoes. <laughs> Actually, I got a failing grade on shoe tying. <laughs> Um, you know, you start with the tying pretty much in the early in medical school, you start with tying and once you get on your surgery rotations, you start helping close the leg and the skin and things like that. So you start to get some skills um, earlier in medical school. Uh, and then as you progress, you start to sew more and more complicated things like blood vessels and, and all, all like during your training. Um, but the first time I actually sewed would be, you know, in a, in a patient would have been in medical school. So if Well, uh, so there's several things. One is if you didn't sew it tight enough or careful enough, you could have bleeding, right? And then you'd never get out of the operating room because you'd just have continuous bleeding. You have to keep trying to repair that area until you get the bleeding stops. So you don't want to leak, so a leak would be one bad thing. Uh, second thing is if you, especially with a small vessel, you could end up sewing it in a way that you've actually kind of closed off the flow to the blood vessel. That would be bad. It would be hard to do that with a really big blood vessel like they were, up, but with the smaller branches, you so people with coronary bypass that can happen, and you can end up with not enough blood flow going to the, by, the vessel you're trying to bypass. Um, because the aorta is pretty delicate, if you're not careful with that needle, you may actually tear the aorta. Now you've created an additional hole that you've got to go in and repair. And it's not so bad on an aorta and an aneurysm, but with these dissections, it ends up being sort of like, sometimes described as like wet tissue paper, right? And so you got to be very careful uh, that you don't tear the wall of the aorta. So another strategy to keep blood going to the rest of the body while the clamp is on the aorta is called uh, is, is to use some sort of pump. And so we call this left uh, heart bypass. It's a way of uh, providing perfusion to the aorta down here while we're working here. So this is isolated between clamps. Clamp on the aorta between the common carotid and the clavian. Uh, clamp on the left subclavian artery, and then a clamp in the mid-descending aorta. Now we can open this and it's not going to bleed and we can do the repair. But we want to keep blood going down here, so we use a pump from the left heart, that's why we call it left heart bypass. This actually goes in the left atrium, so it's getting oxygenated blood. And then it uses a pump to deliver that blood down below the clamp. So this is just pumping the whole time. This just shows the cannula in the left side of the heart. So this is pulling blood, oxygenated. This is going to, it's not on yet, so it's clear because it's just saline. But when we turn it on, oxygenated blood is going to come out of the heart. And the orange thing is just it's called a tourniquet. It just keeps it. So we put a little stitch here, we pull the strings up, we poke a hole in there, we put the cannula in, and then this tourniquet holds it in place. And then here's the aorta down, here's the cannula hold where it's going to be below the clamp. So this is the aneurysm. So you just make a little hole in it, pop the cannula in, and this is going to deliver blood back to the lower body while we're doing the surgery. So we studied that as well. Now this wasn't a randomized trial. This was looking backwards, retrospectively, at a series of 330 patients that had extent two repairs. But we, again, it wasn't clear whether a left heart bypass should be used or shouldn't be used. Is it more complicated than you need to be? Does it provide a benefit? And so we looked. And we compared the patients that had left heart bypass with those that did not have left heart bypass. And you see that there's a reduced risk of paralysis of the legs if you use left heart bypass. So without, it's 13%. With, it's about 5%. What's the alternative to the left heart bypass? Uh, full cardiopulmonary bypass where you would cannulate the patient and cool them down and stop their heart and protect their heart. So now you've got no circulation. Um, because you've got a heart stock, and then you can sort of clamp the aura, and the cold helps protect it. Circulatory arrest, like I told you, hypothermic circulatory arrest, you cool the whole patient down, 18 degrees centigrade, shut everything off. Their heart will stop, 
you don't even have to uh, you don't even have to clean the aorta. You just open the aorta, you collect all the blood, normal reservoir, and they'll send it all back. Uh, those are the main. Or you can just clamp and go as fast as you can, and that's called clamp and sew. It's, some people do that. You wouldn't tend to do it for an extensive repair like that because it's not going to be very successful. But for smaller aneurysms, and abdominal aneurysms, it's clamp and sew because you've got 15, 20, 30 minutes to do the repair without affecting the, the organs. So clamp and sew is another approach. Okay, so back to this. Again, when we've isolated this part of the aorta, pretend there's a pump way down in here, you get delivering blood, and you open the aorta. This is the false lumen here. Once we get that open, we cut that, this, the division between the true and the false lumen, we cut that out, over so some of the intercostal arteries. are here. And then we sew the graft onto the aorta. It's a, it's a uh, polypropylene, so it's basically it's a, it's a plastic suture that will never degenerate. They used to use silk, but silk over time will degenerate. It's biological, so it will eventually fall apart, and so patients were getting into problems years after. So they developed synthetic sutures that will never break down. That graft will never break down. It's long, that'll last forever. As long as it doesn't get infected. If it gets infected, it's a mess. Because now you got to go in and you got to pull it out and you got to replace it and figure out how to do that without getting the new graft infected. So do you extend it when you put it in or does it stay infected? Yeah, so, so um, it does extend, but the ones we use for a thoracal abdominal aneurysm are about three to four times longer than that. So they come pre manufactured with different lengths. That's more of a graft we use for the ascending aorta or arch because it's, it's about all the distance you need, or for an abdominal aneurysm. But for a thoracal abdominal, we use a graph that actually comes out of the box about this long. Okay, so we're cutting out the dissecting membrane. And so then, what about, what are you going to do about the bowel and the kidneys uh, while they're not getting blood flow? Now we've taken the pump off and we're trying to work on that part of the aorta. And so the idea there is, what if we put little cannulas, little tubes, in each of these blood vessels and we deliver blood from that pump to each of those blood vessels while we're doing this part of the repair. It's sort of be warm blood, blood from the patient. Um, some people were doing that. Some people were actually using cold fluid, crystalloids, so like saline or Ringer's solution, and delivering cold to the kidneys because cold is protective. So the idea was if you cool the kidneys, maybe you would be at less risk of getting renal failure from this operation. So which is better? We didn't know, so we did another trial. We compared cold crystalloid to normal thermic blood in 30 extent two repairs. And we looked at, first of all, the instance of dialysis. So that's total kidney shutdown. And uh, all of the cases of dialysis occurred in the cold blood group, I'm sorry, in the warm blood group, and there were no cases in the crystalloid group. But the numbers were very low, only 30, so it's not statistically significant, but that's intriguing. But when we look at rate a bump in your creatinine, which is a subtler form of renal uh, dysfunction, 63% uh, had renal dysfunction in the blood group compared to only 21%. So that's what we use to using cold. So the strategy that came out of that is to give blood to the liver and the bowel through the celiac and SMA, but deliver cold crystalloid to the kidneys to protect the kidneys to try to prevent kidney failure. Kidneys are not as tolerant of, uh, tolerant of ischemia as the bowel and the liver are. And so protecting them is important, otherwise you end up with patients that are on dialysis the rest of their lives, which is not good. But we thought, okay, if cold is good, well, blood seems to be good. I mean, it's got oxygen, it's got buffers, it's physiologic. Maybe cold blood would be better than cold crystalloid. So we did another trial. And this time we came up with this system. So it pulls blood out of the left heart, oxygenated blood, and then we take some of it and send it over to this reservoir, so about 300 cc's of blood, and then we circulate that with this little roller pump, also invented by Dr. DeBakey, through ice, and we just let it circulate. So you end up with ice cold blood. And then when we, and then when we um, stop the flow to the kidneys, we can put these cannulas in the kidney and the renal arteries, and deliver out lots of cold blood to the kidneys. We don't want to do that to the whole body because the body will get too cold. You don't really need to do that to the liver and everything else. So we're giving regular warm blood to the celiac and the SMA. So the liver, bowel, stomach is all getting warm blood, but the kidneys are getting cold blood. And this shows while the clamp is on, so this is time, 
And this is the left kidney temperature, put a little probe to measure kidney temperature. This is sort of normal temperature, and then this is 15 degrees. We the target at 15 degrees centigrade. And the red arrows are boluses of cold blood. So the first time we give them a bunch of cold blood, you see the kidney temperature drops. And then we keep giving additional boluses during this about an hour of clamp time to keep that kidney temperature as low as possible. We kept it below 20 the whole time, and for part of it, um, even below 15. So we're getting that kidney really cold. So we did a randomized trial of 170 patients undergoing extensive repairs. Half got cold crystalloid, half got cold blood, but in the end we saw no differences. So it wasn't protective of the kidney. It wasn't any more protective of the kidneys than cold crystalloid. So urine output was the same in the two groups. The peak creatinine was the same. The uh, incidence of renal dysfunction, no matter how you measured it, was the same. The incidence of dialysis was the same. Uh, mortality was the same. Length of stay was the same. So we showed that cold blood was not any better than cold crystalloid. And because cold crystalloid is simpler and cheaper, um, we've now continued to stick with cold crystalloid. Where's so that's, that roller pump now? What's that? Where's that roller pump now? <laughs> <laughs> In the museum, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so here is reattachment now. So we've reattached the intercostals. We've moved the clamp down to restore blood flow to the intercostals, and now we're reattaching the celiac SMA and right renal, and then separately the left renal. Move the clamp down again so you get blood flow in here while we do the rest of the repair. So that's called sequential aortic clamping. You just keep moving the clamp down. The idea is restore blood flow to each thing as you reattach it. Uh, sometimes the dissection or atherosclerotic disease will actually go into the branch vessels and cause uh, problems with blood flow that way. This just shows a dissection. You see the false movement here actually going into the renal artery. That can pinch that vessel off so you don't get any blood flow. And so one thing we can do there is deploy these stents. So this is uh, about a five millimeter stent, so pretty small. Um, and it's balloon expandable, so it comes on this little catheter, collapsed. When you blow up this balloon with a little syringe, it opens that stent up, and then when you pull the balloon out, you get this stent. And so you can go ahead and stent that open. This is an example, it's a redo. This is the graph, the patient's head is over here, the patient's feet is over here. This is the left renal artery, the outside of the left renal artery here, they had a dissection. So here is the outer wall of that dissection, this would be the false lumen, and then here's the true lumen down here, this is the, the, the rest of the uh, vessel wall. And so we want to tack those together. You could go and sew all that, but the stent works really well. You just insert the stent into the vessel. Here it's fully inserted. Then you blow up the balloon, and you pull the balloon out, and you can see that expanded stent inside the renal artery, and then we just reattach the graft there. There's the completed repair. So to minimize ischemic time, we go fast. First of all, we go fast. We sew as quickly as we can. We use perfusion strategies like left heart bypass, and then we do sequential clamping to restore blood flow to each area as we reattach it. As shown there. So here we've got bypasses going to all of the abdominal vessels. We've moved the clamp down here while we're dealing with an aneurysm that involves not only the lower aorta but the iliac arteries as well. After blood, after surgery, we have to do several things. We have to control the blood pressure very carefully. If it's too low, now you're not getting enough blood flow to things. And that can cause ischemia like kidney problems or paralysis. If the blood pressure is too high, it can disrupt one of those new anastomoses and you can get bleeding. And then your blood pressure gets low and you don't have blood flow going to the spinal cord. So too low is bad, too high is bad. So you got to keep the patient's blood pressure just right. Um, we operate on, re-operate on early if there is bleeding to get that under control and then we manage any problems with the kidneys or the spinal cord with a variety of techniques that we can talk about if you have questions. Scott, how many uh, hands do you have working on this? Uh, you, so you need a team, okay, so you need anesthesia, mm -hmm. so that's generally one or two people, and then you need the OR nurses or techs, so you need one that's scrubbed in, that's handing instruments, getting getting needles ready, getting sutures ready, keeping count of everything. So that's, that's the scrub nurse or scrub tech. Uh, then there's a circulating nurse or circulating tech. That's the person who's running around getting things that the scrub nurse needs. They're not sterile, so they can run around, get things off the shelf, open them, put them on the table, call for problems, deal with all that. Then you need somebody running the pump. 
So that's usually a perfusionist. It's a special special training. They go to school for perfusion, they do cardiac perfusion or perfusion for liver transplantation, this sort of thing. They're running the pump. They're the ones uh, making sure you have the right cannulas and then turning on the pump, adjusting the speed of the pump, delivering medications to the pump. Uh, then you need the people that are actually doing the operating room. So there's generally two surgeons on a case like this and then a variety of assistants. And a minimum for this you would want three total people actually operating, two surgeons and somebody to assist, which could be a resident or a fellow or a medical <coughs> student. Uh, sometimes even four is nice to have on one of these. You have one person that's directing them all? Or yeah, sort of the one main surgeon is the one probably doing the sewing on the blood vessels. Uh, and then another person is assisting them with, with a suture and keeping things out of the way. And then a third person is usually holding some retractors to keep things like the kidney out of the way or a uh, variety of things. Yeah, so, and then one person is usually manning the suction. So um, as you open these, they bleed and you've got to collect all that blood and you want to collect it and save it so that it can go back to the patient. So we have a thing called a cell saver, which Dr. Crawford invented. It collects the blood, puts it in a little... Uh, a reservoir then filters the blood and spins the blood to get out any impurities and then we give the blood back to the patient so they're not you're not having to just lose blood and transfuse the patient the whole time you're actually giving them their own blood back so pretty big team mm -hmm. uh, we looked at our, our current experience this is really Dr. Caselli's experience with over 3,000 of these repairs and you can see about half of them are the extent ones and twos which are ones that have the highest risk, and the rest of the threes and the fours. And this is just going to be an idea of where we are now. So, um, death from the surgery. So you can look at death um, within 30 days or with, before they leave the hospital, which is called in hospital mortality. Uh, more accurate to look at the 30 days or in hospital, because you see the number is higher. Because some people will live 30 days, but then they won't make it out of the hospital. If they die on day 31, think they're a space survive. That's not right. So 8% mortality. Um, that's pretty high for surgery. You know, car coronary artery bypass, very standard heart operation. Mortality for that should be half percent, one percent, right? So for, for cardiovascular surgery, 7% is pretty high. Um, but that's where we are. That's where we are with some operations. Uh, adverse event is a combination of death, renal failure, requiring dialysis, paralysis of legs, or disabling stroke. So the, the chance of something bad happening to a patient during one of these operations is about 14%. The flip side is 86% of these patients come through okay without a major, a major complication. Uh, with a rate of all stroke, 3%. And spinal cord problems, which we talk about, uh, all spinal cord problems, about 9%. Permanent, meaning after they leave the hospital, 3%. So not too bad. And remember, uh, remember where we were on that Crawford curve, which I think I'll bring back up and just show you what sort of improvement we've been. This is the freedom from late repair failure, meaning the graft stays intact, doesn't get infected. You see, all the way out to 15 years, 94% of patients have their repair intact. And this is survival, all the way out to 15 years. So at 10 years, about 40% of patients are still alive. Why only 40%? Age. A lot of these patients are older, a lot of them, the average age is probably 60 to 65, 70, except for those patients with connective tissue disorders we talked about last time. And they have a lot of their cardiovascular problems. They tend to have coronary artery disease and other problems, so a lot of them will die of stroke or heart attack or other diseases over the course uh, of those years. Very few of these are uh, caused by any sort of aortic problem. So this just gets you back to where we started. So the blue curve was that curve from Crawford when you didn't operate on them. So remember, within three years, most patients are dead. Four years, only 25%. That's after diagnosis. And then the uh, green is Crawford series of 1,509, showing you what his survival was. Pretty good. And this is where we are now in the current series of the red. So now at five years, uh, two-thirds of patients are still alive. Okay, a little bit about special techniques, and then we'll move to just sort of answering some questions you may have about you know, life, medical school, you know, research, whatever you like. Uh, branch grafts. So one problem is these aneurysms get so large that the blood vessels, as the wall of the aorta gets uh, big, the branches start to spread out because the aorta is growing, and those branches get further and further away. And this would be an extreme version where the renals are way over here, 
the sea lag gets in there and there. So you can't really even reattach those as one patch because you leave them with this big, large uh, sack. So, um, and then this is another problem. Sometimes we do a repair, but we've left behind some aorta that's diseased, and it can turn into an aneurysm. So here, we've done a focal abdominal already. But now that patch where the visceral vessels is has gone on and degenerated and turned into its own aneurysm. And now you've got to go fix that. So that's where uh, Caselli came up with this idea of a branch graft. So these are manufactured with the four branches already in the correct location. So now you can, re you can do one of these repairs. And instead of just doing a, a patch, you can individually bypass each of the, each of the arteries, renal, SMA, and CLAC. So now you've got no aorta left. So there's nothing to dilate up uh, over time. And that patient's not going to come back with a new aneurysm revolver in their abdominal aorta. And then on the left, there's a, an actual uh, photo in the operating room. So the patient's head would be to the right, the legs would be to the left. And so that's the reattached celiac, SMA, and then the, the renal spot here. Oh, another quiz. OK. What branch is that side graph? You can't tell based on this beautiful anatomy here, where everything <laughs> looks just like a textbook. Yeah, this is what you know, so this is what stuff looks like, particularly in a redo. You, it's very that's why you have to know the anatomy in a way that you understand it. You don't need to see it in perfect form like you would see in an anatomic drawing in in an anatomy textbook. That's that's the celiac there. So this graph is going to the celiac. Uh, this one's going to the SMA. This is going to the left renal. This one's going. that. Uh, then there's something called uh, a, a reverse elephant trunk. So what's that for? That's when a patient has an aneurysm not only of the thoracic abdominal but also the ascending and the arch. So they need this part repaired and this part repaired. But we're going to do this first because it's bigger or it's symptomatic. And so this is a technique to make the second operation easier. And what you do is you take that graft and you fold it inside itself so that you end up with the tail of the graft. We call it the elephant trunk. It's hanging in the graft at the end. And you use this folded edge to sew that up here. And then you do the rest of the repair. So the intercostals here, and the distal anastomosis at the level of the celiac SMA and renals here. And that's what the first stage repair looks like. So here, you can see it sort of faintly in there is what we call the elephant trunk, suspended in that graft there. And then this is the aneurysm that's going to Six, eight weeks later, they're going to come back for an operation through their sternum to the front. So the heart would be down here, aortic valve. Here are the coronary arteries here. And then here's the um, innominate left carotid left subclavian artery. And then here's the old graft. We just reach in there, grab the graft, pull it out, cut a window where the, seal, where the uh, arch vessels are, reattach those as an island, and then reattach it right above the aortic valve, and now you've got a single graft replacing the entire thoracic aorta. Um, that's beneficial because it, otherwise you would have to do an anastomosis here, which takes more time, which means more ischemia to the heart and the brain. Uh, and also you are prone to have bleeding there at that anastomosis. Now there's no anastomosis, it's just one continuous graft. Do you ever predict that that might happen, and then you put the tail, you put the elephant trunk in it? Uh, yes, so we, we call that prophylactic, and right. it, like we, if the patient's aorta was a little bit large, but maybe not large enough in the ascending to need repair, but you think, well, maybe in five or ten years they're going to need that, well, we'll do this so that it will make that second operation um, easier. Yeah. Uh, so here's another example, ascending arch, big thoracal abdominal aneurysm. They did the thoraco first, telegraphed, is sort of showing this shadow here, and then they use that to complete. Okay, the last thing I'll talk about are endovascular aortic uh, repairs. So some of you may have heard of stent grafts. They're perfect for small aneurysms involving short parts of the aorta. So this is a descending thoracic aneurysm. And the stent here is placed with a catheter. So this is a catheter is placed in the femoral artery in the groin. And the catheter, which looks like this, has this graft compressed onto it. Graft is made out of some sort of synthetic like Dacron or uh, Cortex, and then it has these wire stents on it. Those wires can be those can be compressed down, and then when you unsheath it, they'll open up on their own inside the aorta. And this is an example of a stent graft uh, that would be used for one of these descending repairs. 
So they're held in place, not with sutures, but they're held in place by the radial force of that step graft against the normal area above and below the aneurysm. So they're relying on a seal between this expanded graft and the wall of the aorta. So you've got to have good seal at the two landing zones, so here and here. If you have good seal, then the, all the blood will go through the graft, bypassing the aneurysm. The aneurysm is not uh, pressurized and it won't rupture. So that's called endovascular aortic repair. That works really well for short aneurysms like this. Why would that not work for a thoracogonal aneurysm? Uh, it's not so much the, well, if, if the aneurysm, yeah, so the examples I showed you, the aneurysms were all the way up in here, right? So that means you would have to land that thing in here, and that would be a problem. Why? Yeah, it would block the blood flow to the branches. So the thoracobdominal aneurysms have all these branches we have to deal with and reattach. So if you just do a, a tube graft like this, you, you're not restoring it, you've not preserved any flow to any of the organs. So in general, and maybe some other time we'll talk about some newer approaches that use stents for thoracobdominal aneurysm. In general, that's not going to work. But the key here is that this repair relies on this staying sealed. The problem is patients with disease often will continue to have degeneration of this part of their aorta, and eventually those seals can fail. So right now they've got an aneurysm here, but now as this dilates up, now you're going to have a problem. And not only do you have a new aneurysm, you've now blown that seal. And so now you've repressurized the whole thing, and that can cause some trouble. And here's a 54-year-old patient, had a dissection of their aorta, had a stent graft in the descending, just like I just showed you. And then four months later came back with an 8.5 centimeter thoracobdominal aneurysm that looked like this. So you can see, here's that stent graft, just like the one we're passing around. It had sealed here fine. But over time, it lost the seal here as the aorta dilated. So you have a failed seal here, and you've got this large aneurysm. And so we, we have to do standard treatment for that. And we go and we take this out, and we replace it with a normal graft. Uh, and there's a photo from the operating room. Here's the stent graft that we removed. It cost about $20,000, by the way. And then here's the new graft. And we had talked about the length of the graft, so you can see how long these are, uh, the ones that are designed for this operation. Well, that's kind of my next question. So if something like a failed seal happened, would that be on the surgeons, like on the patients? Yeah. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, it's a complicated uh, question, because there are a variety of things. And there are reasons you might put in a spec graft, even if you know it's not going to be durable. Like in somebody, who has a rupture and you're just trying to save their life and get the blood the leak stopped, knowing that they may have to come in to get a more definitive repair. Uh, sometimes you don't really know whether the aorta is going to... So, a lot of patients, the stent grafts work fine, so I don't want to give you the idea that once you put a stent graft in, it's doomed to fail. In fact, most patients do fine with their stent grafts. And for the rest of their lives, because they're older patients with other types of disease, the rest of their lives, those seals are fine. And they live the rest of their lives with a stent graft. But in some patients, and it's hard to predict who, some patients will fail, and then once it fails, then you've got to do something more definitive. So um, it can be on the surgeon if they've made a bad judgment about who to use a stent graft in. Maybe um, if you had 10 surgeons, nine of them would say, I wouldn't use a stent graft in that particular patient. So maybe that wasn't very good judgment. Then it really is sort of on the surgeon. Maybe there's some technical problem during the surgery, right? And those things happen. Uh, but it may just be due to the patient and their disease and the progression of their disease that you couldn't have predicted. Okay, so this, case, this patient did well, no kidney problems, no spinal cord problems, and he went home on day 10. Uh, this was actually the very first one we did where we took a stent out. And uh, he had been operated on in a, a place in Arizona that was doing a lot of stent grafts. This is before stent grafts were widely approved and widely used. And the patient had abdominal aortic aneurysm, 5.7 centimeters, a pretty good size aneurysm, 71 year old guy with bad disease, hypertension, coronary disease, had, had a stroke, had, had a valve replacement. Not somebody you want to do a big operation on. Okay, and so they put a stent in him. And it failed to seal approximately. It's called an endo leak, type 1 endo leak. So they put a little 
extension. It's like that graft, only only about that long, so you can go a little longer and get a little bit of extra length. And they put a, a cuff in there, and it failed to seal, and it came back. Now he was a 6.8 centimeter aneurysm. So they put another extension. This is 14 months later, and then it failed again, and now he's 8.4 centimeters. Anybody want to guess what they did next? <laughs> they put four more extensions. Okay. I mean, they, you can only go so, uh, otherwise you're going to block off the renal artery. You can see how close they are to that left renal artery. And in fact, you could cover over that left renal artery and say you're going to lose your left kidney, but you can do pretty well with one kidney. But we got to get this thing fixed. And so they four more extensions, uh, and then that failed, and it was a nine centimeter aneurysm by the time we saw him. And so we did him through a thoracic abdominal. This is the a CT scan. So this, the metal, on CT scan sort of lights up, right? So this is the stent, and this is the aneurysm. This is the blood in the aneurysm, so there's a contrast in it, so it lights up. This is not lighting up because that's clot, it's just thrombus that's collected inside this big aneurysm. Here are the kidneys, right and left. Y'all read CTs at all? Yeah, we may do that one trip down. I'll bring some CTs. It, that way you can sort of correlate what you're seeing in an anatomy class to what we see with imaging, which I think is really kind of, uh, kind of neat. Okay, so this is a huge aneurysm, um, almost nine centimeters. And so we, we pulled that whole mess out and used one of the standard grafts. Uh, we were able to do it right below the right renal artery, just had to reattach his left renal artery, and then his iliacs were big, so we um, replaced those as well. So is the surgery that you explained to us before, is that just not very pervasive, and so that's why they just kept putting on these cuffs because it was easier for them? Or is that for them? <laughs> I, I think the judgment went out once they got past the third or fourth failure. I mean, I think, you know, but that, but that would have been in, you know, I don't want to arm sure a quarterback this, right? This is an old guy with bad heart, bad stroke, bad kidneys, who they didn't want to open up and clamp as they were, uh, and they were worried about. So they figured the stent graft would be a lower risk alternative, which it is, absolutely. And although this case didn't go well, there probably had hundreds where people lifted their stents and did well. Um, but eventually that failed, right? And uh, then you have to sort of bite the bullet. You just say, well, you're too sick to operate on. That's why we didn't do the original <coughs> big operation. Or you say, we're going to bite the bullet and do the big operation because this thing's just not going to hold. And then we did. And he did all right. Um, but it's, every operation is a, is a balance between how likely are they are to get through the operation versus how likely if we don't do the operation is a bad outcome. And every patient is a little bit different. And then there's no exact science to that. So everybody's decision about that balance is a little bit different. And so it comes down to that, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, last one. 54-year-old hypertensive guy. Seven years earlier, he had his upper descending repaired uh, with an open and then uh, had a stent graft put in the lower part when the lower part dilated, because this is progressive disease. So part of his aorta was fixed, then the rest, another part. By the time we saw him, uh, he had failed down here, developed this aneurysm extending to the right iliac artery. Here is the old regular graft. Here is a stent graft inside that, so that's sealed well, but the seal down near the celiac fell apart in, um, so normal diameter aorta here, the, the, the halo here is the metal from the stent. You see it here on the scan here, but then you get down to this level below the stent, and you see how large the aneurysm is. Uh, this is probably the celiac branching off the aorta right there, and here's the renals here. Okay, so failed seal. Uh, so we, uh, we, we remove the aneurysm, replace it with a stent, a regular graft. You can actually leave the stent in place if it's uh, secure. And so we just sewed to the stent graft there, took out the aneurysm, and replaced it with, with a regular graft like that, and that guy did well. So in summary, um, these aneurysms, uh, if you don't repair them, survival is dismal. They'll, they'll ru eventually rupture. Most of, the, most of them will die within two or three years. Uh, multimodality approach is used to reduce the complications like spinal cord problems and kidney problems. Uh, and we're constantly thinking about ways we can do these operations safer to reduce the associated complications. But outcomes of open repair are favorable, and some complex challenges can be managed with different techniques, as I showed you with the reverse elephant trunk, the branch graft, and then removal of failed stent